Hello, I am Mayor Kim Carr from the city of Huntington Beach, and I want to thank you so much for joining us for our final candid conversation, conversations about COVID. And as you know, we've been doing these since January, and this series has really been a fantastic opportunity for us to engage with our residents, answer some great questions about the pandemic. We've talked about everything from the vaccines, the vaccine rollout, where to get vaccinated, how to sign up for the vaccines, what's the latest about the pandemic and programs that we've been offering here in the city to help you through this crisis. But tonight, I am so, so grateful that we have Orange County Board of Supervisors, Katrina Foley joining us. Katrina is a community leader at heart, a successful businesswoman. She's a working mom, an attorney, and as most of you probably know, she was Costa Mesa's first directly elected mayor in 2018 and 2020. She served a total of 12 years on the Costa Mesa City Council and for four years before that on her local school board of trustees. Now today, Katrina is our newest supervisor for the second district of Orange County. And she just assumed office last month and she represents Costa Mesa, Cyprus, the beautiful city of Huntington Beach, La Palma, Los Alamitos, Newport Beach, Seal Beach, Stanton, Rossmore, and portions of the Buena Park and Fountain Valley. Katrina, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's conversation. And then of course we have our Huntington Beach Fire Chief, Scott Haverly. And Scott has been guiding us on this journey from day one, has been instrumental and has just been a wealth of knowledge for us, making sure that all of our residents are COVID safe. So Scott, thank you so much for once again, taking time out of your evening to join us and update us on the latest. So um, the next slide here. Well, a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. So we're going to kick it off with COVID-19 updates. We'll do a brief overview about the facts about the vaccines. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the J&J &J vaccine. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about the county vaccination pods. And of course, Katrina, you're going to give us a lot of information about that. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about what we've done here locally. Uh, with COVID-19 programs to date. And then at the end, we always do a quick Q&A. So just to remind everybody, if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, put those questions in the chat and we are monitoring those throughout the evening and we'll take those questions. And then as always, we take all of this information, including the PowerPoint presentation and upload it to hbready.com forward slash town hall. And then if you have any questions about COVID, where to get the vaccine, or you just want the latest information, just go to hbready.com forward slash vaccine and you'll get everything that you need to know. So with that, I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna kick it on over to Scott Haverly and he's going to give us the latest on COVID-19. Thank you, Chief, for joining us. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate the opportunity to do that. And so what we're going to talk about initially in the beginning is we're going to talk about kind of where we're at with COVID. And I think we're making some great progress. We do have some good news that we're seeing more and more. And in the United States, we're seeing the numbers drop in the majority of the country. There are some areas where we're having some hotspots that we've talked about. However, in, in California, we're doing really well. And in Orange County specifically, we're doing well. And so if you look at the chart on there, you can see really the dramatic effect that the vaccines have had on the COVID cases in Orange County. And so what we kind of want to compare it to now is kind of the seesaw effect, where we're seeing cases slightly go up a little bit in the, the one day and slightly go down the next day. And a lot of that is because uh, we've hit this kind of plateau and uh, the people are, are going out to get vaccinations. And I think that we've got vaccination sites throughout the county. We've done a really an exceptional job of getting opportunities for our residents to be vaccinated, whether it be in Huntington or anywhere in Orange County. And so, when we look at um, pandemics or we look at these type of things, we're looking at that plateau line and watching where it's at. And the longer it stays in the plateau, that's where we worry about having spikes. And you can see that over the course of the time where the spikes have come after plateaus. And so right now we're in this, in essence, seesaw effect of vaccinations 
versus um, new cases. But overall, though, owners are doing really well. And we just want to caution that it isn't over. We still need to social distance, wear masks, and really encourage people to move towards vaccines. Now, if you look at the California on the next slide, you'll see the majority of the state, about 82%, greater is orange. And orange is a good thing for us. I think that's a good move that we move forward. We're really hoping that we're going to be at yellow tier uh, before June 15th, but it's likely that we're going to stay very close to orange throughout that entire time. We try to project out those long models. As long as we keep seesawing, I think although it's not, it may look like we're hovering in this area, but I think that's positive. Our hospitalizations are dramatically down. ICU cases are down. Uh, people over 65 the death rate and infections are incredibly low compared to where they were before. I think after vaccines started, as a reminder, you know, we saw in our skilled, skilled nursing an 82% drop in, in hospitalizations and death rate after the vaccines. It was so dramatic. Um, and I think that's something we want to kind of reiterate to people that more vaccines and the more social distancing and the mass wear, we just need to keep that up so we can keep moving forward towards the yellow tier. If you go to uh, the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about um, – the trending. And so I think everybody's pretty excited. The governor came out and said, starting June 15th, we're going to be able to go back to some sort of normalcy, what that looks like. And I think one of the things that we talked on there is that if we have, if we continue with the vaccination effort, we continue working together uh, to maintain social distancing, we have to kind of keep going. And I know, believe me, I'm with everyone. I'm done. I'm tired of wearing a mask. I'm tired of doing all this stuff. I want to get out and do what normal looks like. Um, and so we want to go back to how HP was before that. There's all these great things we're going to be able to do, and we're all looking forward to doing that. And if you go to our beaches and you go there and you see people outside, we're just, we're just ready. And I'm with you. I'm, I'm right there. But I think it's so critical we just continue to move forward with these precautions. We just stay steadfast. It's, it's going to be for a good reason, and we're going to continue to move forward with that. And, and the long-term solutions are good for us. So next, we want to talk a little about the, the vaccines and kind of where are we now. And that's obviously been in the news a lot in the last couple of weeks. And on the next slide, we'll talk about the, the two that are actively being used, and that's the Pfizer and uh, Moderna. And so those are the ones that came out first, as you know, and they require two shots. Now, um, their efficacy rate is over 94%, which is, which is really amazing. And in that area, when you're talking about vaccines, you know, the flu shot can range anywhere from 30 to 60% efficacy per year. And when these vaccines are designed, they're very effective. Uh, if you get the Moderna, you're going to wait 28 days on average between, but it's okay. A lot of people get or call us and they get nervous about, well, it's 29 days, 30 days, it's fine. You, the minimum, you don't want to go earlier than 28, but you can go a week or so after if something happens. I mean, life happens, you miss your appointment, you got to redo it, it's okay. You can work through that and it'll be fine. Um, the, the Pfizer is 21 days apart, and the same thing goes there. It's not it's, We prefer you not to go earlier, but you can go a little bit later and be fine. If you're really worried, you can contact your doctor and consult with them or talk to people at the pod. But ultimately, you can still go a couple of weeks past and be just, and be just fine. And I think with this, you do have some uh, we, you know, side effects that will go with that. And what we really know, just, and just from in Huntington, from our staff, and talking to people that we vaccinated the pod kind of anecdotally is, you know, you get – after your second dose is when you're more likely to have um, to have side effects. If you've had COVID um, and you get your vaccinations, on the first dose, you may see more side effects. And those side effects are typically, you know, you might be tired, you might have a low-grade fever, you might have what we call like general malaise, you might have an area where you just, you have the body aches, kind of that mimics slightly um, the virus. And, and actually, that's not a bad thing. I think some people initially were worried about that. That just means your body's reacting and building up the immunity. It isn't bad if you don't have a reaction, but it's not bad if you do. So um, a lot of people will ask us questions about what does this mean? Did I, did, did I, am I getting COVID? And you're not. It's, it's a perfectly normal process. I will tell you, I've talked to one of the other ones that after I got my second vaccine, I definitely was a little tired the next day, but I did. I may or may not have used that as an excuse to watch golf all day on Saturday because I said I'm tired for the vaccine. So it worked out great, and I got to watch the whole golf tournament. So I was happy about that. But at, at the end of the day, though, it is normal. It is part of the process, and it's okay. It's okay if you're having those reactions. Um, the next one we'll talk a little bit about J and J and J, and that's been in the news a lot lately. And I know that there's some trepidation when it comes to what that looks like for us. But I, I have to tell you and reiterate that. Six, six women out of 6.8 million had those side effects. All with all vaccines, there's going to be side effects and where they're at. And, and it doesn't downplay anybody who had those reactions, and, and our heart goes out to that, and that's, and that's not something we want to see. However, that is a possibility that can go. When you look at the, the percentage of, of people who get sick, could get sick and die from COVID or have permanent disabilities related to COVID, and the effect of J&J 
it's really it's really a negligible component. However, I think the CDC, FDA did the right thing. They pulled it to study it, to look at it. That's what we want. That's it. There isn't any. It's very transparent. They want to pull it, delay it. Let's let's have that conversation and have experts look at these. And, then, and they've done a great job of that. They've done a great job communicating that. Um, just recently, the European Union has said that the vaccine itself, they'll need to have a warning label to put it back in service in Europe. Uh, it talks about the possibility of blood clots, but in addition, the European Union talked about the fact that the vaccine outweighs the side effects. That that small, as you see on their point zero 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 nine percent chance in my every reaction. Um, so that's kind of that's where J and is right now. We're hearing that you know uh, some of the discussions that by Friday we may hear some discussion about what the the, uh, the process is going to be. But I think it's good. I think it's important that things happen. And I, you know, and it's not good that we have to work through it. But the idea is that I think the government did the right thing. The FDA and CDC pulled it off, looked at it, evaluated it, very transparent about it, and so we can get it back in service if, if that's appropriate. But it sounds like it will move forward by the end of this, end of this week. Um, next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about. There we go. Thank you. And so a lot of people will bring up, hey, how do I trust this vaccine that's moved in record time? And, you know, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's, and normally when you talk about uh, new drugs or vaccines that one on the market, sometimes they take years to do that. So the thing that we, I think we have to all understand is that none of the steps were skipped. I mean, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We're going to move faster to get things done, but none of the steps were skipped in the process. And so what was I think what was a really great collaboration is that the government, a lot of different government entities expressed funding ahead of time. So there were a lot of times if you think of a drug manufacturer moving forward, they'll go through the process, the approval process of the FDA, they'll get the emergency approval, and then they'll tool up, tool up their operation and, and manufacture the, the vaccine. And that's an enormous type of drug, whether it's for... Um, you know, for cholesterol or anything like that, that's how they would do it. But what they did this time is they actually started producing the vaccine when they got to the trial component. And that way, once it goes through the approval process, if it's approved appropriately, they have a stockpile and they can launch it out and start going right away. And I think that is why we're able to move it so fast. And I think this is a, it's a great example of, of government working with private sector for us to work together to get to our um, to communities quickly so that we can make a difference. And really by Christmas, we had... Um, vaccines and arms and healthcare workers and first responders, which is pretty amazing. Now, the Pfizer and Moderna, much different than what we're used to with the flu shot. Um, these are MR, mRNA, and this isn't a new technology. It's just a way to engineer the, the vaccine a lot quicker. Normally, when you're a flu shot, they'll grow it in kind of a nutrient broth, protein broth, uh, usually egg based, and they'll have to grow that vaccine for the flu. Here, we're able to manufacture it, so it moves a lot faster. Another big question we get all the time is about uh, affecting your DNA. This vaccine doesn't enter the nucleus of your cell, so it, it doesn't, it won't affect your DNA. In addition, it's very sensitive. That's why it's stored so cold. That's why it has a very short shelf life. When it's injected, it goes in. It's in essence the way I really like that I've heard it explained. Um, it's, it's kind of a map. It's a roadmap. It goes into your system and it provides your cells with a roadmap to develop the spike protein so that you can fight off coronavirus. And I think that is a brilliant system, really, to, if you think about it, what it's doing. It's just teaching ourselves how to react and how to handle that. Um, on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about... There we go. Um, so then also one of the things we're going to move forward on is, is the timeline, is how we do that. You know, social media, you know, is, sometimes it's our friend, sometimes it's not, right? And, but ultimately, this time it was because it allowed us to get a large study of volunteers quickly. And one of the things that's interesting with uh, coronavirus especially is uh, because it was so contagious, it, it so contagious, they could really move that study up a lot faster. And, and it's something that you don't want to have to say that, oh, this is a contagious virus, but it, it did help in the research and moving the research a lot quicker. A lot, uh, a lot quicker. And so right now um, when we're talking about that, the, the vaccine and kind of moving ahead, we have also heard from um, Moderna and from Pfizer that we may need a third shot throughout the process, that they're looking at how many months we will need and how that will work. And that's just in the, at the early stages. And each month and each time that we've talked about, it's extend, extended a little bit more. So we'll kind of watch that and we'll find out. And we have this incredible system in place of vaccine delivery that is getting better every day and getting more available every day. And so as a result, if we need to do that, then we'll move forward and, and do that. But I'm glad that they're working through this process that it's transparent and they're having these great conversations. Um, so the next slide talks about what I can do after I'm fully vaccinated. And, 
you know, this is this is really interesting because if you're at the Potter location, there's this real excitement and energy there when people are getting their vaccine. I mean, how often do you think that people will go to a place to get a shot and be excited about it? I know having, you know, three kids growing up, taking them to get their shots was like the worst day ever, right? You don't want to tell them that you're going to do that. But people are in line and you can see this kind of horrible energy and excitement because they want to be able to, to get back into society and do that. And I know... When you're, when you, once you get the shot and you're able to uh, move back into, you know, some sort of normalcy, it's, it's really a great feeling. So I know for like, for us, for me, you know, my grandparents are, my, excuse me, my parents are in their seventies, my kids are in their late teens. So my kids are going through the vaccine process right now. My parents have already been vaccinated and my parents are so excited to come down and see our, see their grandkids. You know, they haven't seen their grandkids in over a year. I know that's, it was doing this great, but it's just not the same thing. You know, for my mom, you, you can't hug anybody on Zoom, right? And so I, I know that process and that excitement and energy, we see that at the pod every day. And that's that's invigorating for a lot of us to see what people are able to do. And I think that's kind of an exciting process. So once you're vaccinated, you can get into and be into a room with, uh, with other people uh, without a mask that have been fully vaccinated. You can also be in rooms with people who aren't vaccinated, but you want to limit that to just one other household. You don't want to be in these large gatherings. You don't have to be. The mask is still the way to go. Go in and down. Um, and if you are around somebody and they call you the next day and say, oh my gosh, I tested positive with COVID and you're vaccinated, you don't have to run and get a test unless you develop symptoms. That's a big change. We were testing people every time we would have an exposure, we would have to send 10, 15, 30 people out to get tested and watch them. Now, if you've been vaccinated, if you don't have any symptoms, then you don't need to go get tested. I think that's a great change for us. Um, the next one is talking about can I stop precautions after getting vaccinated? And really, the reality, no. It's just, no. I don't know how to, you know, everybody talks about, well, I don't have to do this anymore. I say, no, you still need to do that. It's a responsibility that we all have and that we're all doing really great at. You see it everywhere. And so we really encourage you that we still have to wear a mask. And so one of the questions I get pretty regularly is, if I still have to wear a mask, wear a mask social distance, and do all that, why go with the vaccine? And I think that's an important question to answer because the reality is wearing a mask, wearing a mask is not going to prevent you from getting COVID. It's going to, it's going to restrict it and make it, it'll make it better. It'll, it'll prevent you a little bit, but the vaccine is the number one way to do that. And, you know, having the mask, you can still get it. You can still be hospitalized. And unfortunately you can still, you can still die from this disease. And so with the vaccine and the mask, it's just that extra level of protection to keep us safe, to keep us moving forward towards herd immunity, which is really critical for us to be in this. If you look at the world and how the world's working, it's really, it's, it's very sad how the United States is doing really well. California is doing even better. But, you know, India is having a million cases every five days. Uh, you know, South America is having some, really some explosions in those areas of COVID. And it's really the vaccine rollout is, is where we see the difference. The vaccine rollout here is strong. It's accessible and it's more accessible. And as a result, we're seeing a much better area. So, you know, really to that end, the more people we get vaccinated, the more people are wearing masks, the more social distance, the faster, the better off we're going to be moving towards that normalcy with that. Well, thank you so much, Chief Haverly. You always do such a complete job of outlining everything, and you're just a wealth of information getting us up to speed on everything. But you're absolutely right. Everybody feels this sense of joy when they're at uh, one of these vaccination pods, everybody's super excited. And with that excitement, you also have the after effect of, well, I'm good to go now. I don't need to wear a mask and I'm with, you know, I, I can do whatever I want. And, and that's where we have to kind of walk everything back a little bit. But I couldn't agree more with you about being able to you know, like my kids being able to see my mom and for us to get together again now that we're all fully vaccinated and just my own little vaccination story. Um, the second shot kind of got me a little bit and maybe just being a busy mom and you know, taking care of the city. I didn't have the luxury to just kind of lie around and watch golf, but you know, I, um, I was pretty busy. So, but you know, a little bit of Tylenol, I was, I was good to go. So um, they're definitely, you know, I think we all feel that. But um, now, you know, when, you know what, before we go on this, Scott, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the variants that we hear about. And, and um, have we found that some of the vaccines are more effective against the variants than others? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the British uh, 
variant that is pretty much predominantly the United States. The vaccine seems to work well with that one. Mm -hmm. There is one from South Africa that's a little more challenging that we're still kind of studying. And believe it or not, there's a California variant as well uh, that's moved through. And so I think the key with the variants is that each time the, the disease is passed, it's replicated, and that's where it comes up. But in essence, there's mistakes in the replication that turns into variants. And so the idea is the more that that's when people say, well, that's okay because I'm if I'm younger, I'm not going to die from it. So if I get it, I get it. Well, every time we pass it, we run the risk of having more variants. That's why in, in, the, in the world, as they pass it more and more and more, the variants grow and, and get worse. So. As of right now, they're still studying a number of them, but the, the main variant that we're seeing in, uh, in California, it seems, to be, it seems to be doing well with that, or working well with that. Well, that is a great explanation of how these variants grow and continue to, you know, we, we see new, new ones every month, it seems like. So um, now we're going to kick it over to Orange County Board of Supervisor Katrina Foley and talk a little bit about what you've been doing and the vaccinations. And I know that um, you know, we still get questions on where to get vaccinated. We get that question actually quite a bit. So um, thank you so much, Katrina, for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, really excellent job, Chief. You did uh, amazing to really make it very simple for everyone to understand. You covered all the important questions that we're all getting. Uh, thank you so much. I'll share my little vaccination story. Um, the, it's funny, my husband was watching golf and I laid down the second day after I got my second dose of Moderna. Uh, I just laid down on the couch for a minute and I woke up like 10 hours later because it just knocked me out. So your second day, be careful and prepare to do nothing. That's what I would advise. <laughs> um, but I do feel a sense of kind of a, you know, relief uh, and comfort to be able to kind of maneuver around in the community a little bit more. I attended my first big community event, uh, Mayor Carr's event at the park this last weekend. That was actually my first big community event other than uh, opening the fairgrounds as a vaccination site. So one of the things that we've done uh, in District 2 to really immediately after getting sworn in, I got sworn in March 23rd officially. By March 30th, we opened the Orange County Fairgrounds as a super pod. And I want to take a moment to thank the fire service, uh, both Orange County Fire Authority, as well as all of our city departments for their role in really helping to stand up the super pod throughout Orange County. It, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much for all that work. Please pass that along to all the fire service members. Um, but we also, uh, the following week after opening the vaccination site at the fairgrounds, we then opened it for extended hours because one of my priorities is we need to make sure it's accessible to working families, to people who maybe don't have paid time off to be able to go and, um, and take a day to get vaccinated. So we've extended the hours Thursday nights until 8 p.m. And then I just was in a meeting today with Dr. Chow, our health officer, and we were we will be changing the times at the fairgrounds so that we have hours 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day so that families who work can go after work and get vaccinated. So here's a great slide. Um, we opened uh, March 31st. Uh, and I guess March 31st, not 30th. And um, we're doing about 2,000 inoculations a day. Uh, starting, I think it's next week, we're gonna bump that up to 4,000 a day. And at this point, we, um, before I got sworn in, other than like Huntington Beach, you did a great job of your city partnering with Huntington Beach Hospital. Uh, city of Costa Mesa, we partnered with Ho one time, but other than that, there was no county vaccinations going on in any mobile clinics or super pods in the district. And now we've got many, many uh, uh, mo mobile clinics, sorry, as well as the super pod. Um, by, uh, by the time that we got here, we've already done 2,300 doses um, in our mobile clinics. We had our first in uh, Stanton. We had a mobile clinic in Costa Mesa last week in uh, 
support by Share Ourselves as well as Save Our Youth. And then on May 1st, we will be having a vaccination site right here in Huntington Beach um, in Oakview. And we're really excited about that. Um, we're trying to reach at least 6,000 residents in District 2 through these mobile uh, clinics to be able to get more people vaccinated. And um, we've had, since the fairground site opened, we've vaccinated 44,000 residents at the fairgrounds. And we're looking at, by June 15th, getting up to 216,000 more residents vaccinated. So we are on a mission. My goal is to have a vaccine clinic in every single city every week uh, until June 15th, because I know we've been talking at the county about Independence Day and celebrating our independence from COVID, uh, but really June 15th is the date uh, because the governor is opening up the state on June 15th and you know, we better be vaccinated uh, before then. So we'll have some veterans programs that we're rolling out in May. We're also going to be vaccinating anybody who is working at the Orange County Fair because the fair is opening uh, in July. And so we wanna get all those fair workers vaccinated. Um, anybody can get vaccinated right now. You, you can get vaccinated at Walgreens, at CVS, at a community clinic, at the fairgrounds, in Anaheim at the convention center. You know, appointments are preferred, but they're not required. Uh, you can just go on to the Othena app, O-T-H-E-N-A.com and sign up. Usually at the fairgrounds, you can get a same day registration, but if not, it's maybe the next day, um, but you can get vaccinated in so many different places. And I know Mayor Carr has been working on making sure that her community gets vaccinated locally um, in partnership with um, community partners. So we'll keep moving the vaccines out. I wanted to let everyone know that the fairgrounds, the testing site there is gonna be shutting down. Um, and in large part because of something that the chief said, we don't have to do as much testing now. But if you go to the OC Health website, you can find uh, places where you can get tested for free. You can also get just tested at home. You can order a kit, they'll deliver it right to your home and you can do the test from home. So uh, those are some of the projects that we're working on regarding COVID uh, relief and the vaccinations. But I also wanna talk a little bit about an item I have on the agenda for Tuesday. Uh, you know, I got right to work, you know, we had to figure out how to put items on the agenda. And so we are requesting that the board of uh, supervisors take the, some of that American Rescue Plan money that's coming and target $5 million per district for 25 million to give commercial tenant rent relief. And that'll help our commercial tenants. Uh, some cities have moratoriums, some don't, but there's a lot of deferment that's building up for some of our commercial tenants, especially some of our restaurants that have been closed, our personal care services. So we're wanting to give them some rent relief and bridge that for them to get through COVID. Uh, we also have on our agenda for Tuesday, a uh, million dollars for arts related uh, businesses and nonprofits. So those are both on our uh, agenda for Tuesday. And then there's another COVID relief um, item related to uh, food distribution. So for food insecurity, we'll have $2 million per district. So we'll be working in partnership with all of our cities. So looking forward to talking to you, Mayor Carr, about how we can make sure that anybody who is food insecure in Huntington Beach is fed. Well, thank you so much for all of those legislative updates and especially for the um, support for commercial businesses. Um, you know, a lot of these businesses, particularly bars, haven't been able to open for a year. And, um, you know, we've had a, a couple of people in the downtown area ask for some help because this is, it's, it's gone on for so long. And so, um, you know, to have that opportunity, I hope that passes. I think that's, that would be a tremendous benefit to so many of our small businesses who were shuttered for a good part of last year. And there's yeah, still- well, encourage, a I encourage you to help them. Um, share how they can email the board and show their support for this item. Um, they can email uh, the clerk of the board or they can email me, katrina.foley at ocgov.com and we'll forward it on to the rest of the board. But 
Um, if you can help us get the word out, and uh, yes, I think it's an important item. Uh, you know, I ran on a platform of we need to have business recovery because we've all been through a lot. All of these local businesses that have just been shut down completely, no revenue source. Um, the PPP is just insufficient. So we're trying to help them get through what I think is going to be a huge economic recovery uh, this next year. I think we're going to see it, a big surge. Everyone's ready to go out. I know Everybody I am. Everybody <laughs> is ready to go out. And we're definitely seeing that here in Huntington Beach. But I will get the word out to those businesses that have been reaching out to me um, on the commercial level to get a little bit of help so that we can lobby for that money to be returned here in Huntington Beach. I think that would be a great benefit. And, and here, you know, in Huntington, we've been doing our own sort of um, trying to help. But as you said, it's, it's a drop in the bucket for what actually needs to be done. We've given out almost $5 million in small business grants, but we know, you know that's going out in $5,000, $10,000. It's, it's not enough when you've been shut down for almost a year. And then we've also had our 1HB uh, program, which is where we were selling T-shirts that say 1HB and different merchandise to, you know, again, raise more funds and to try to help some of these small businesses. But it's... You know, everything that we've done from closing down Main Street to allow for more outdoor dining. We've had um, the Surf City Stroll, again, that allowed for more of the outdoor dining so people could also do retail outdoors. Um, we've done everything from water bill payment relief. Um, we did a concessionaire's rent holiday. And then, um, you know, we've also been looking at deferring some of the uh, hotel tax. And so we've done a lot, but... Anything that we can also, if we can piggyback on something that the county is doing to help our small businesses, is it's so greatly appreciated. And I really want to thank you so much for all that you're doing to make the vaccine more readily available to residents. Because as you mentioned, not everybody is available Monday through Friday. Um, everybody, especially here in Huntington Beach, a lot of our, our residents, they work in the hospitality industry. And if, if they're working in the... Uh, Restaurant industry, they're, they're not working eight to five jobs. So to have that sort of flexibility to get these vaccines, it's so critical. And um, one of the things that you mentioned, and this is a question I get asked a lot, is do I need to have an appointment? I can't seem to get an appointment. It's impossible to work this. So you mentioned you you could. You could you can walk up to some of these places. Yeah, you know, they prefer you to have an appointment, but I encourage people, I just want people to get shots in arms. So if you don't have an appointment and you want to get a shot, just go drive up. I'm sure they'll let you in. That's they'll it. figure it out. <laughs> yeah, they'll figure it out. The goal is to get shots in arms. I know at our community clinic in Costa Mesa last weekend, we had lots of walk-ups. Okay, that's great to hear. And I know that the um, the event that we're doing on May 1st with the county to help a lot of our residents in the Oakview community, we're actually going door to door to let people know about this opportunity. And we hope to vaccinate 500 people that day. Um, and then also, I, I like to let our residents know about that the Othena app is one way to get the vaccine, but there's also my turn. And Fountain Valley Regional Hospital is now a, a, a place where you can get those vaccinations. And I, I just logged on today just to see, you know, how tough is it to get a vaccination? And there were lots of appointments available. If you're interested in going to Fountain Valley Regional Hospital, that's another opportunity. So lots of, of great news about if the vaccine is readily available. Katrina, do you ever think that the, the vaccine will be available at like the grocery store, like, like the flu shot? Oh, probably. I do. I think that that's going to be necessary. Unfortunately, it's going to be with us for a long time. I think Chief pointed that out. We're going to be looking at a third dose already coming up in the fall. And so, um, you know, it'd be like, what is it, boosters like we get for the kids when they're little. So um, I do think that's going to become something just normal. And I, I think that we've got to do away with these super sites and and get it back to just being part of your normal doctor visit or go to the community clinic or, or to, you know, the pharmacy um, and get your vaccine there. But I do want to also reiterate, I do wear my mask, even though I've been vaccinated. And this is one of my favorite masks. Is a, a shout out to Huntington Beach. Uh, yeah, and Melissa Murphy, who designed that. Yeah, That's our beautiful HD artist. So Melissa Murphy, she designed those. 
Yes, beautiful. And we are, um, if anyone needs masks, I have masks. Uh, I have disposable masks. I've got cloth masks. So uh, no one should be without a mask if they want one. Um, and just, you know, thank you so much, Mayor Carr, for, for doing these town halls and educating the community. It's very important. I wanted to say one more thing about the veterans. Uh, when we do our veterans event, because I know a lot of our veterans, they don't want to get out of the car. Um, maybe some have struggle with the walk so from the, the parking lot into the building. So we're going to be doing a drive up um, at the Orange County Fair, Fairgrounds in partnership with Heroes Hall and the VA. And so uh, if you want more information about that, please do just email our office and or call our office. You can call 714-834-3220 and we'll get you information about how to sign up if you're a veteran. Okay, and it's, so it's open to the public or you need to have a reservation? Um, that's yet to be determined. It's going to be, it's only veterans, so it'll be, we'll be targeting veterans, but I'm hoping that it's just going to be drive up if you're a veteran. You know, they want everyone to sign up so that they can uh, document how many residents we vaccinated so we can have a better understanding in terms of the data and how close we are to herd immunity. That's really what it's about. Right. Uh, that's that's great, Katrina. Thank you so much. Um, so I have, we're going to go and, and transition now into our Q&A. Um, but one of the questions I have, um, really, it's for you, Chief, and, and maybe you can answer this, or maybe, you know, it's a kind of, a, it's a big question. It's basically, you know, how do we determine when the pandemic is over? And we've talked a lot about that green tier. And right now we're in the orange tier. We're hoping to move to the yellow tier. Um, when do you, what's the metric really for moving into what we would call the green tier? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because I think when we looked at it, we were we were moving down these tier system to orange, to yellow, and then this possibility of green. And then when the, um, the governor released it, we're gonna almost take out the tiers entirely in June and to see what that looks like. And so I think now we're, we're shifting again of, of how that process, but I think when we're out of it, um, that'll be that'll come from either the CDC more directional because what's happening now is Cal the United States is doing well, um, California is doing really well, but then when you look world climate wise, it's not, and so they're going to probably put out more restricted travel here coming uh, um, from the CDC about going to other countries. So some countries are doing well. So I I think for us it's really going to be that time when the vaccinations are there, the um, the rates have dropped. I think we're I think we just went over a little over three million people have died from the virus so worldwide and i think we're going to have to see that number really shift in uh, worldwide uh, as it does in the united states i think we're i definitely think not we're a long ways off but we're definitely a ways off from that mm -hmm. um, but we'll see it more from a cdc declaration with the who is what i would is what i would guess on that okay so one of the questions that we've gotten here is um if you're sick with covid because unfortunately people are still coming down with covid how long should somebody wait before they get the vaccine? Or 30 days, 60 days? So a lot of it depends on the treatment. So it depends on the type of treatment you receive. If you've gotten the antibodies and some of that, you might have to go as many as 90 days. So the CDC talked initially that you may have some immunity 90 days after you recover, which is that's, the, um, the, that's basically you having greater than 10 days with those symptoms. Um, However, they're also talking about the fact that once you're past that 10 day mark and you have no symptoms for greater than 10 days, you can move towards getting the shot. Um, a lot of that is going to depend on how sick you were, uh, if you had very minor symptoms or if you were in the hospital for pneumonia, kind of in between. And I think depending on the level of, of um, how sick you were during COVID is something you really want to talk with your doctor about and have that conversation with your doctor to say that I'm recovered and I'm this many days and what's the recommendation to do that? I mean, that would always be my my uh, recommendation. And, and one of the questions that I hear from residents um, is, well, I had COVID, so I don't need to get the vaccine. What would you say would be like that? No, absolutely not. COVID, it, it, having COVID, uh, is, they're talking is maybe – you know, 60 to 90 days uh, may get you that. Um, but it, the vaccine is actually way more efficient at protecting you from COVID than the antibodies you get from getting COVID, which is kind of really interesting. A lot of people, I think, initially equate it to kind of the chickenpox concept, mm -hmm. right? Well, I had chickenpox, so I can't get it again. It isn't like that. It's 
the, the night the immunity doesn't last long and, and there is a lot there is some studies that talk about that if you had a, uh, a you had a very light version of it maybe you had didn't have the level of symptoms your immunity is even is even less but the, the greater case you had the longer you had it may extend the immunity and so there's lots of discussions on what that looks like but according to medical doctors what they're saying is um, having COVID does not prevent you from getting it moving forward yeah so that is still highly recommended and I would think too it, it even if you had COVID, it maybe wouldn't protect you from some of the variants that you talked about earlier. Yeah, and absolutely. the vaccines to be, seem to be really effective um, at, at protecting you from that. Um, so the, the question that comes up too, I mean, we're seeing it here in Huntington Beach, a big tourist destination. A lot of people want to travel. Um, people are asking, uh, is it safe to travel? I think for I think overseas, I would say uh, I would advise to look at the CDC's website to see what restrictions they have on the different countries because every country is a little bit different when you're talking about going overseas. But I think if you've been vaccinated, you're wearing a mask, you're social distancing, you're, you're washing your hands, doing all the things we talked about, the travel domestically is a lot safer. And there are some areas of the country that are having um, you know more hot spots than others. And I would definitely look at those and pay and be aware of that. But, uh, but if you've been vaccinated, then traveling domestically is okay. Okay. So, Katrina, I wanted to ask you about the OC pod. Um, one of the things I hear from people is they, they want a particular vaccine. Um, so, at the, at the different pods, I mean, how do, which ones are, are, are being offered right now by the county? Right. That's a good question. So, um, Orange County Fairgrounds is the Pfizer vaccine. And then if you go to the Anaheim Convention Center, that's Moderna and Pfizer. I think Disneyland is also offering, you know, that's Disneyland uh, has very limited offerings. It's mostly for um, those who need accommodation uh, due to disability. And so they're offering, I think, one or the other. Um, and then Soka University has uh, Pfizer and Moderna. Okay, and so Katrina, if, if you're a, a 16 year old, I would imagine you, you've got to bring your mom. You've got to be there. Yes, if you're a minor, you can't just drive up into the pod. You have to have a parent with you. That's right. You have to have a parent or guardian with you, or you know, grandmothers or grandfather. You have to have some uh, adult who is in charge of you that can sign off and consent that you can have a vaccine. So it can't be my friend. Correct. <laughs> can't just be your friend who's your same age. Uh, and that's really important because at our board meeting, there was this uh, misinformation out there that the county was vaccinating children under 16 years old without parental consent. And that is false. Please know that is absolutely false. That's not happening. You must have parental consent and you must have a parent with you or a guardian with you in order to get vaccinated. Right. You can only be 16. And they, they ask you, you know, when you get vaccinated, they ask you a laundry list of questions. You know, are you allergic to this and that? And, and uh, you know, I, I know when my daughter got vaccinated, she's 17. You know, they asked me all those questions and then asked her all those questions and right. got to sign everything. So, you know, it's uh, but, but on that line. So you need to bring an adult. Um, and if you don't know the answer to this question, do you what, what documents do you need to bring if you're going to any of these pods? Do I need well, a driver? You have to bring, in, have to bring any documents. Uh, other than if you're a minor, you have to bring a parent or a guardian with you. You don't have to bring any documents. Um, you're not required to have any insurance. You're not required to have any kind of identification. Uh, you just need to show up. Uh, and and but one thing too to keep in mind, uh, the Pfizer is the only right now the only um, uh, vaccination that's used for students over 16 years old. Uh, we were going to do J and J, but then it got pulled back. And I agree with the chief that was the right thing for them to do to study it more and to to make sure it's safe. And so as that rolls out some more, we'll be able to do the JJ for um, students as well. But right now it's only Pfizer. Right. And that, that is a good point because um, 
my daughter had to get the Pfizer one. I got the Moderna one and we couldn't go together because of that. And, right. you know, it was something that, oh, yeah, you have to be 18 to get that one. So what happens? I know you get a little card that says that you've been vaccinated, but and a, a lot of places are giving you a free donut if you have a card and everything. But what happens if you lose the card? Well, if you lose the card, you have your uh, vaccination digital record on your with your vaccine sign up. So there's a digital record of your vaccine. And if you want, you can access that digital record you, to prove you've been vaccinated if necessary. Okay. It's not mandatory, but it's a courtesy that the county is providing so that people can show that they have been vaccinated. And you're right, those little cards, I mean, I remember every time we'd have to go with the boys to get vaccinated for when they were kids, I would search everywhere looking for those cards. <laughs> it was like a little book. And uh, so it's nice, I think it's nice to have a digital record. Not everybody wants to do it. You can opt in or you can not choose to use it. Well, I agree with you. When my son started college, I had to find that little booklet. And that was, like you said, where did you put that? You, had, you know, I haven't had to use this in a decade. Where did it go? So um, it, it's kind of nice to have everything um, in, all in one place. And then, um, so Chief, I have a question for you that just came through. After I get the vaccine, when can I expect it to start working? So uh, there's, it's, it's really interesting that the uh, Moderna, Moderna example is 80% effective after the first dose, which is, I think is pretty interesting to look at. But it's once you have the second dose, it's two weeks after the second dose is when you're fully at the, the, the level. But it's working. It really is working right away in some form or another. So even the first dose, you have a level of uh, efficacy. I think Pfizer is 50% and Moderna is 80% is the last ones I saw. And so even after the fir first dose, you're seeing something, but it's two weeks after the second dose. And I don't know if you know this off, or maybe, maybe Katrina, you know, um, how many people in Orange County have had at least one dose or are vac fully vaccinated? It's over a million, right, Chief? I, yeah, I believe so. I, I was trying to look at the number when she asked that, looking that up. Because I, I remember seeing something that it was like over 50% of the Californians have received at least one dose. And I was just kind of curious, you know, if, if we've done a little bit better here in Orange County, because, you know, we've really been trying to get that information out to everybody. I know here at Huntington Beach, we've been trying to let people know how to get it. And it's it seems like it's getting easier and easier to get the shot. Um, those that want it seem that they can get it. Um, but I was just curious. If nobody knows, that's fine. I'm, I was just there's, there's 3.2 million people in Orange County, and I know it's over a million shots we've given. It's probably in my inbox right now because every night we get an update. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Well, we see that. Yeah. Go ahead, Chief. Oh, there's over over 130 or 133 million uh, for the United States, which I think is pretty pretty amazing to have at least had uh, at least had one dose. Yeah. And so all of that data, I would imagine it's all getting funneled up to the state and then uh, nationally. But I just think it's, it's amazing. It, we, we started doing these conversations, Katrina, in January, and we were all just kind of holding our breath and waiting and thinking, oh, maybe someday we'll be able to get the vaccine. And we thought, oh, it's going to happen in February. And then, oh, maybe in March. And so now we here are at the um, end of April, and it's it's just readily available. And it just feels like we're you can see that light at the end of the tunnel, and we're we're right there. But as Chief has said many many times, we're we're not there yet. So we still need to make sure that we um, take all of the precautions necessary. But um, I thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor Katrina Foley for all that you're doing and you really are a game changer in making sure that this vaccine is accessible to everybody and um, you know we definitely saw a huge difference the minute that you came in like you said within a few days boom this this pod was open and it's just you know more and more of looking out for our small businesses and you know getting that money back to our, our community so that we can really make it through that that second part 
Um, so I don't have any more questions right now, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you want to say any closing words. Again, I'm so grateful that you took time out of your crazy busy day. I know you know what it's like to be a mayor, and you know how busy that is, but I can't even imagine what it's like to be a supervisor when you, you're managing all of these cities, not just Costa Mesa. You're, you have all of these cities. So I'm so grateful that you were able to join us this evening and share with us what you have planned for uh, sure. District 2. It's being a mayor on steroids, for sure. <laughs> uh, but it's fun. And I enjoy the service. I've really enjoyed getting to know the mayors and the city managers and the other elected officials in each of the cities and the district. And I've had a chance to meet with all of them and ask them about what their priorities are. How can we in District 2 support them? I know uh, Mayor Carr and uh, your city manager, Oliver Chi, we've all talked about what we can do to help. And we've already started moving forward with some of those uh, discussions in terms of your asks. So, um, we're just here to serve. Avery Counts is our uh, constituent services manager for Huntington Beach. So you can reach him at avery.counts, C-O-U-N-T-S, at ocgov.com. And he is available for certificates, ribbon cuttings, uh, birthday cards, or even, you know, troubleshooting if people need help with a service at the county whether it's uh, veteran services or health care services, you know, child care services, whatever, we are here to help. And so our office is all about the service of so whatever we can do to assist and support the residents, the businesses in District 2, we're here. No, thank you so much. And I, you, we really are making a huge difference in District 2. And I can't thank you enough. And thank you so much, Beverly, for everything that you do. Like I said, you know, you're our go-to guy for everything COVID. And I couldn't ask for a better expert or a better leader to keep um, Huntington Beach safe. So I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And as I always, I always say, hbready.com for anything that you need COVID related. Tonight's town hall will be uploaded into hbready.com forward slash town hall. I want to thank both Supervisor Foley and Chief Haverly for spending your evening with us and thank you so much to the residents of Huntington Beach. Please get your vaccine and uh, let's move forward and have an amazing summer. <laughs>